Welcome to lecture 19 of BIB 201 Bible Doctrines 1. Today's lecture is going to be continuing in the section on the nature of God by finishing up about how God is unified and then talking about how God is a spirit and God is a person. So let's get started. Number four, the unity of God does not destroy the doctrine of the Trinity. If you remember from the previous lecture, we discussed how there are only three monotheistic religions, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. And then we also talked about how the unity of God is emphasized in the Old Testament and confirmed in the New Testament. Now let's talk about how this does not destroy the doctrine of the Trinity or triunity of God. Letter A. We believe in three persons in the Godhead but one God. Letter B. This is what is called a compound unity. This compound unity is seen all throughout the Old and the New Testament where you have all three individuals as separate but then confirming their equality. And then letter C. The name Elohim supports a plural unity. Elohim is in the plural, but interestingly enough, when Elohim in the plural is talking about God doing something, the verb that always follows is going to be in the singular. That is important because you have to have a subject verb agreement in writing. Here, the subject is, is plural and the verb is singular, showing there's a compound unity to God. And this was even hinted and alluded to in the Old Testament before the New Testament came along and solidified the teaching. Then letter B, not only is God unified, God is a spirit. Now this is talking about the nature of God, not the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit. So number one, as a spirit, this describes his divine nature. What does that mean? First, letter A, that means that God is not material. God is not physical, he is metaphysical. Material is matter. In 1 Kings chapter 8, we find out that the universe cannot contain him. Why? Because he does not have a literal body. Now, obviously God the Son does, but we're talking here about theology proper, God the Father. And then Isaiah says that the heaven it, the heavens are God's throne, or heaven is God's throne, and the earth is his footstool. Obviously, this is a little bit what we call anthropomorphism, which we'll talk about later, but another very key verse is John 4.24. In John 4.24, God said, God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. And we're going to come back and revisit this verse a little bit later, but I wanted to show you that this verse explains from Jesus' mouth that God is spirit. Then letter B. God is not dependent upon matter. Since he is a spirit, he is metaphysical. He is not dependent upon the physical. He's not dependent upon matter. An example of this is in Jesus' words again in Luke 24 verse 39. In this passage, he's talking to Thomas, and he says, See my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Touch me and see, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. So, as flesh and bones, humans, people, things that have matter, are dependent upon matter. God, a spirit, is not dependent upon matter. But then also, letter C, God is above census perception. Census perception. He's far, so far above our capability of understanding him with the five senses we have. An example of this is found in Exodus 33. In Exodus 33, Moses said, Please show me your glory. And the Lord said, I will make all my goodness pass before you and will proclaim before you my name, the Lord, Yahweh. And I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious and will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. But, he said, you cannot see my face, for man shall not see me and live. In this passage, Moses was only allowed to see God's back, so to speak. Again, he's a spirit. It was what we call the Shekinah glory of God, the manifested glory of God. Now, is this easy to understand? Of course not. That's why in your notes, 1 Corinthians 2, verses 7 through 16 is listed there, because Paul calls this 
a mystery, something that is so far out of reach of our mindset because we are dependent upon matter to try to understand a metaphysical being that's not dependent upon the very things we are. And then number two, as a spirit, this means that he is incorporeal and invisible. Incorporeal means that he is not subject to human limitations. And then invisible obviously means he cannot be seen. Colossians 1 verse 14, 4, 1, Colossians 1 verse 15 supports this when Paul said, He is the image of the invisible God. I'm talking about Jesus here. The firstborn of all creation. creation. So Jesus was the image of the invisible God. And then number three, as a spirit, we are to worship him in spirit and in truth. I mentioned to you that we would come back to this. In spirit is distinguished from a place or a form. And truth is distinguished as false, as from false conceptions resulting from imperfect knowledge and religious systems. So Jesus is having this conversation with the Samaritan woman, and there she's trying to argue with him about the proper place to worship the Lord. The Samaritans had their place to go worship, their own mount, and of course the Jews had theirs in Jerusalem. So she's trying to find out which one is right. Jesus says there's going to come a time when we'll worship God in spirit and in truth because he is a spirit. So that is focusing upon not a place, but anywhere in spirit. Wherever we are, you don't have to go to the temple, don't have to go to Jerusalem. So again, the spirit is distinguished from a place and truth is distinguished from a false knowledge of religious systems. And then number four, as a spirit, Problems concerning God have developed. So what are some of those problems? Well, what about letter A? Scriptures that ascribe to God bodily parts are anthropomorphic or symbolic. There are many passages in the scripture that appear to ascribe to God the Father as human parts. We call this anthropomorphism or symbolism. An example of this is in Isaiah 59 verses 1 and 2. Here it said, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, or his ear that is it cannot hear. So this passage right here is basically not trying to say that God has a hand or God has an ear. It's saying that you cannot get so far away from God that his hand cannot save you. And you cannot get so far away from God that his ear cannot hear you. But look at the next part. But your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you, so he does not hear. Again, anthropomorphism. He does not have a face. This is showing that he has symbolically hidden himself from them because of their sins and will not answer their prayers. And then, letter B. God's appearance to the patriarchs was a temporary manifestation of God in human form. This is commonly called a theophany. A theophany is an appearance of God the Father in human form. The most popular one is in Genesis 18 when the Lord God comes to Abraham in human form. But he does not stay this way. This is a temporary manifestation of himself to mankind most likely because in genesis there's such so little revelation of the nature of god the best way for god to commune with his people especially abraham the only person in the old testament he called his friend was in a physical form and then let us see not only is god a spirit god is a person but what does that mean number one as a person god possesses the power of self-consciousness and self-determination. Self-consciousness is basically that understanding that you exist, that you are. An example of this in Exodus 3, 7, the Lord God said, I have indeed seen the mystery of my people in Egypt, I heard the cries, and I am concerned about their sufferings. He acknowledges his own self-consciousness there. And then in Exodus 6, he says, I am the Lord and I will free you from your burdens of Egypt. Of the Egyptians, I will redeem you. I will take you as my people. I will be 
your God. That's self-determination. He had a goal. He had a will. He had volition, determination. And then number two, as a person, God possesses all the elements of personality. Now, there are three elements of personhood, mind, will, and emotion. So letter A would be intellect. God possesses intellect. How do we know that? Well, number one, God knows. And what does he know? He knows everything. Number two, he remembers. God has a very good memory considering he knows everything. He remembers everything. And then number three, he reasons. In fact, not only does he reason, he tells us to reason with him. Isaiah 118, come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. He is an intelligent being and he wants us to use our intelligence as well. But not only does he have intellect, let her be, he has emotion. He has emotion. There are four specific emotions that I'd like to focus on here. The first is the emotion of love. Now, I will be the first to admit and to preach that love is action. However, there's always an emotion tied to it. Now, you can all you can show love without the emotion, but if there's never emotion, then you have to beg the question, is there truly love? God loves. He loves us. He loves the world. He loves everything and everyone. And then number two, God hates. Say, well, if he loves, how can he hate? He hates sin. That is what his hatred is focused against is sin anything we say think or do that displeases him number three he is jealous what is he jealous of he is jealous when we put anything above him he is in a relationship with us and doesn't want anything else to be put above him just like you would not want any person you were in a relationship to put someone above you and then number four he is angry and this anger is seen multiple times in the Bible. And even the very fact that there is punishment shows that there is also anger. And then lastly, we have the mind, we have the emotion, and now here's the will. We can also call this volition. Volition is will. There was decision on God's part in Genesis 3, Genesis 6, all throughout the Bible. Therefore, there is volition. So as a person, he possesses all three elements of personhood. And then number three, as a person, God's names and personal pronouns indicate personality. Now we've already had an extensive section on God's names, but if you remember any of those, those names show his personality, show his personhood, give attributes about him that help us understand who he is. And then fourthly and lastly for this lecture, as a person, God is alive. God is real. He exists. He is not just the creation of someone's writing. He always has been, always will be. He is. Well, that brings us to the end of Lecture 19 for BIB 201 Bible Doctrines. Hope you enjoyed it. If you have any questions, please do not hesitate to contact me.